lets me record, but it doesn't let me do that. Well, Angie, you might not have the screen. That's okay. Okay. So it is time to start since we are two minutes late. I should have printed off tons of copies. It is very popular day to day. So I am going to have to, you can either download these or I will get you some additional ones. I apologize, not knowing for sure how many people, but I could have somebody upstairs print them off for us. That might be better. Shauna, could you do me a favor? One, two, three, four, five, six. Could you just tell somebody, just go upstairs and tell them to make six copies of this. Yeah, six copies of this. Okay. Are you happy today? You're ready to go, boy, yeah? If I take off my glasses, you're all blurry. But I can see close really good. Okay, I'm going to give you all a packet which talks about buying documents. Now, the neat thing about this particular packet is when you flip the pages like this, it'll show you the form and then on the right hand side it will tell you about the options of what you can do or fill out on the form. The agency is one pretty simple because it just says put in the company name and phone number but then when we get into the, the purchase and sell agreement it goes through all the different little things and we'll be doing that. So I'm going to start on the simple ones while those copies are being made and then we'll end up going through them all. Okay. Now we're not really going through we're, every single form, we're going to go through the majority of the forms that are utilized when we have the buyers. Now, online here, it has agency disclosure, brochure, and it says buyer and seller. It's the same exact form, but on Instanet, or I mean, form simplicity, it just has the field set up to be filled in with a buyer or a seller if you use it for a particular form. The key things to keep in mind here on the agency disclosure brochure, we're required to give that to everybody on the first substantial business contact. Here's a notice that's new for this year. Well, not that, that one, it's down here. Da, 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 da. Surveillance, audio video surveillance. Have you ever gone into a home and there's a camera? By law, you're supposed to be notified if you're not part of the, if you're not the one involved in the recording. So if you ever have a listing and your sellers have a camera, you should have them put up a little paper or something that says you're, you're under surveillance. Have you ever gone to Walmart? How many people here have not ever gone to Walmart? Oh. We've all gone. Okay, right? So Now, in the parking lot, there's a sign that says under surveillance because they're required by law because they're not part of the group if they're recording. Same thing with the house. So on here, it says use caution when discussing anything while viewing a property, audio or video surveillance surveillance equipment could be in use on listed properties. Since we're required to give this brochure to all prospective buyers and sellers upon the first substantial business contact, the attorneys feel that they've been given notice. So if you're working with buyers and you're showing them homes, hopefully you've given this to them before you start showing homes because it's letting them know that they could be recorded. On this particular form, all we need to put down is the name of the brokerage and the phone number before you give it to them. Now make sure you put down the full company name, Keller Williams Realty East Idaho. And then for the phone number, you put the office number down. It's not your team number. It's not how to get a hold of a team member or something. It's to get a hold of the broker. And that's one thing that some people have done wrong is they'll put down, oh, I'm going to put our main number here at the team. Morgan likes to do that because he, he likes to get the calls. But it's in case they have a problem that they can reach the broker. Okay, so that's the only thing we need to worry about on the agency disclosure brochure. Any questions on that form? Okay, so let's go back page. In this nice handout that you will have shortly as they're making copies of it, the next document is the lead-based paint one that we'll go through. There are two copies of this form. There is this particular one here that is under those forms, and there's also one that's under the company forms. So depending which one of the two forms that you like for the lead-based paint, you could use either one of them, but we're going to go through this particular one that's under the main part of the forms. When are we requ required to give this or have this filled out? 
Okay, what what age do the properties need to be? 1970 what? Eight. Now it says in the law built prior to, prior to 78. So if it was built in 1978, are we required to have it? Technically, no, but it doesn't hurt to have it. So if we are doing something, go ahead and fill it out if it was built in 78. But if the other office will not give you one because they're saying, oh, it says prior to, then okay, we're fine. But if not, go ahead and take it and we can get that filled out. Maybe we should tell them to make a few more copies, but we'll, we'll see what happens. You're okay, you're okay, you don't need to. All right, so on here, everybody needs to have a copy of the lead base paint. So if it does qualify, and here we're dealing with buyer's documents today, so let's assume we've got one from the seller. It'll have the property address up here. The seller will have selected one or two things here, and here it says to check. The other form that you could see says to have the seller's initial there, so it could be initialed by the sellers. If not, and you're using this one, it's just checking one or the other. They can either mark that they know of lead-based paint hazards or they have no knowledge. Same thing under the records. If they have any reports, they do or if they don't. If they mark that they do, we need to get a copy of them. So if you're working with a seller, keep in mind that if they ever choose to test the home, they're going to now need to disclose that to future buyers. If it became a big deal and it's taboo for lead-based paint in the home, that could be a negative. Many times I've told sellers or buyers to just pretend like it does have lead-based paint so if there's ever chip or peeling paint, you don't sweep it with a broom. You're going to use a wet mop to get that up so it doesn't put those air particles in the air. And the other thing is, is here we're going to be required to give a brochure to our buyers that talks about lead-based paint. Here the buyers have the acknowledgement. Here it asks for them to initial. They can re they've received all the copies listed above. Now I've had some people argue that they're not going to initial that because they didn't get any copies. If it comes down to that, I'm not going to fight them. But normally the person would still initial this and they know that they did not receive anything, but they're, they're acknowledging those two things up above. D, purchaser has received the pamphlet, protect your family from lead in your home. That is one of the documents that you can give out from Instanet or Form Simplicity. What I recommend that you do is you attach that as an email because it shows that you sent it to them. Then we have additional proof that they've received it. Now they get to check either number one or two, I or little i, received a 10-day opportunity or some other agreed upon time to test for it, or they've waived the opportunity to test for it. So they'll mark one of those. Then here it says agent's acknowledgement to initial. Agent has informed the seller of the seller's obligation under the US code and is aware of his or her responsibility to ensure compliance. What agent initials this? The listing agent. Now, there is one of the forms that has two little lines there, and we have a lot of the agents working with the buyer that initials it. Now, did the agent working with the buyer actually inform the seller of their obligations? No, most of the time, no. So you don't initial that if you're working with the buyers. That's going to, going to be the listing agent, the one that talked to them. Now, there are some circumstances. If you're working with a for sale by owner, maybe you did. You were required. If you're the only agent involved, then you could be the one that initials that. Then we have the seller sign and the seller's agent, the buyer sign and the buyer's agent. Now the law for lead-based paint, it requires the seller make this disclosure. And because there's licensees involved, we are getting involved to help make sure that this disclosure is made. Any questions on the lead-based paint form? All righty. <clears throat> the next one is the property disclosure form, the RE25. So we'll scroll down to that one. <clears throat> now there are two different forms. There's the RE25 and the RE25A. Now the RE25, this is the main one that we use. The 25A talks about being exempt. We've had some problems where people have made a recommendation or have said, oh, you're exempt from filling something out. So you don't need to fill it out. Turned out to be they were not exempt and it cost our office $25,000. So, we don't make that assumption if they're exempt. What if someone's never lived in the home? Are they exempt? What if it's been a rental? They've never lived in it. It's always been a rental. Are they exempt? We see some other offices, and sometimes I, I 
maybe somebody from ours, that have written on there, seller has never lived in the property, it's been a rental. So they don't want to fill it out. The law doesn't exempt them from that. Now, the seller's property disclosure form should be filled out by all sellers. So let's say that there's a husband and wife, and only one of them fills it out. That's not right. They both need to fill it out. What if there's four partners, and it's a partnership? Well, we should try to get all the partners to agree and fill this out. Why? Maybe one handled all the repairs, but this other one is the one that's filling it out. And they're filling it out to the best of their knowledge. At, yeah, well, I know nothing bad about this, nothing bad about that, but the other partner did. Same thing with the spouses or whoever owns the property together. We want to make sure that it has a full disclosure. And on the buying side, we want all the buyers to acknowledge this because it lets them know if there were any concerns or problems on here that they're going through the transaction and purchasing it with full understanding. There have been times where we've added a buyer onto a, onto a transaction. Maybe, maybe they needed some other person to help with the credit or for financing. If we ever add a buyer onto a transaction, they need to acknowledge everything. The blue brochure, the buyer representation agreement, if we're using that, the property disclosure forms, everything, so they can have seen it all. Some people argue and say, oh, it just says on there that they've been added to the contract. Well, that's not very good if it stands up in court because the person can say, I was never told about this property problem. I was never given that brochure for agency, which is required by law. I was never given that seller's property disclosure, which is required by law. So my agent is the one that should have given it to me. And there's some liability there. Okay, less I digress. Back to the property disclosure form. On here, it says that it's not a warranty of any kind. There have been people trying to say, oh, it said that something was included on here and it wasn't included. Or, oh, it said it was working and now it's not, so I'm going to sue because they've caused some type of a problem. So let's read a little bit of the verbiage on here. Idaho Code requires the sellers of residential real property to complete a property condition disclosure form and deliver a signed and dated copy of the completed disclosure form to each prospective transferee or his agent within 10 calendar days of the transferor's acceptance of the transferee's offer. Residential real property means real estate or real property that is improved by a building or other structure that has one to four dwelling units or an individually owned unit in a structure of any size. This applies to real property, which is combined residential and commercial use. So if I have a single family home, is this required? How about a triplex, fourplex? How about a fiveplex? No. So a fiveplex technically does not require it. However, it says commercial that has combined use. I would like you to fill one out. It doesn't, it's kind of not super clear. It's better to disclose whatever you can. Now, if you have two fourplexes and you're selling the whole thing as one unit, eight units, it says you don't really need to. But if you're going to sell them separately, two separate legal descriptions, then yes, you're going to have to have one for this fourplex and one for that fourplex. If we're working with the buyer and the buyer is wanting to buy that as one big loan, we might advise him or her to buy it as two separate legals because if they ever want to sell one of those fourplexes off, if it's under one loan, it's going to be very difficult for them to do it. So we might have them buy it as two separate legals, two different properties. So if they ever needed to in the future, they could sell one of those properties off as well. So have the property disclosure form filled out. Now, if it's a, if it's a commercial structure and there's an apartment in it, do we need to fill it out? Yes. Okay. So if there's anything residential on it, one to four units, not the bigger ones, then we need to fill that out. Yeah. I have a question. Okay. Okay. The person buy the entire block with three or four residential. Okay, three or four is under four. In one legal description. Mm-hmm. Can be separate later? Yes, but it may be difficult. Because what happens is if they get one loan on those four properties, uh -huh. in order to take one of those legal descriptions off, the lender typically is gonna say no because they they have the money for all of it. It's possible, but then you're going to have to declare how much value each one is, and the lender is going to have to agree to have that be removed. So it would be better to have 
and you can have one transaction, but buying this is illegal, that is illegal, this is illegal, and that is illegal. So four separate things with legal descriptions. Okay? Talk to your lender about that if, if you get to that point or let me know, okay? Then it comes down here and there's three different questions. If the, is the property located in an area of city impact adjacent or contiguous to a city limit and thus legally subject to annexation by the city? Yes, no, do not know, or the property is already within city limits. There's these three questions. And the law has about eight or nine things that are required for the property disclosure law. Well, it's actually not in this book. I wrote it down that we should put it in the next copy of the book. But so this is put out by the Idaho Realtors, and there's a lot more questions on here than you really need to have. But more disclosure is better than less. So how would how would you answer this part right here? Well, it depends. They're trying to find out for tax purposes. That and the next one, does the property, if not within the city limits, receive any city services, thus making it legally subject to annexation? Number three, does the property have a written consent to annex recorded in the county recorder's office, thus making it legally subject to annexation? This is because of taxes. Right now, taxes are this. But if it's going to be annexed into the city, the taxes will go up because they'll be receiving more services. So this is a disclosure because the seller should have received something in the mail or some type of a notice if that's going to happen. What if, um, what if the prop said property that's being annexed doesn't actually get any services, but they are gonna have a tax, higher tax rate? Yeah, so here it, it has that lower part, does the property have a written consent to, uh, to annex? So whether they have the services or not, that's why they have the three different questions, okay? The purpose of this statement, it's made by the seller on the conditions and information concerning the property known by the seller. This is not a statement of any agent representing the seller, and no agent is authorized to make representations or verify representations concerning the condition of the property. Unless otherwise advised, the seller does not possess any expertise in construction, architectural engineering, or other specific areas related to the construction or conditions of the improvements on the property. Other than having lived at or owned the property, the seller possesses no greater knowledge than that which could be obtained under careful inspection of the property by the potential buyer. Unless otherwise advised, the seller has not conducted any inspection of general inaccessible areas such as the foundation or roof. This disclosure is not a warranty of any kind by the seller or by the agent representing the seller in this transaction. It is not a substitute for any inspections. The buyer is encouraged to obtain his or her own professional inspections. A lot of disclaimers. This is to protect you as the agent and also the seller. So the buyer gets this and we want to make sure that they have the opportunity to confirm some of this information. It is not our job as the agent to confirm all of that, to verify it, even though there's people that will still sue us because of that. If somebody has a question about this, say, let's get an inspector, let's go find out. Do not ever discourage somebody from having an inspection. Yes, sir. So on that real quick, so say somebody has done, like built a house themselves. Okay. Or home, they pulled a, a homeowner's permit for plumbing or something okay. like that. Where would they disclose that? Well, under the plumbing part, they could just put that down under remarks. Or on the last page where there's some additional information that they could put, they could put some information here. Or you could attach a piece of paper to this and say, see attached Exhibit A or additional pages five and six. Would they be required to do that? They wouldn't be required to do that, but if it's something that's relevant, because it talks about any substantial additions or alterations made without a building permit. Did they do something without a building permit? They're going to need to disclose that. So if we ever have a buyer that wants to know more information, what we need to do is put it in writing and address that to the seller, signed and dated, and say, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, we are in. We have a copy of your property disclosure form. You said something about doing some work on the home. We'd like more uh, further explanation about what the work was done. Did you get a permit? All this other type of stuff. And the seller would respond back in writing and explain that. That way we have the documentation. Does that kind of answer what you're saying, Morgan? How, how would you... Well, we're not doing the seller part. We're doing with the buyer. So on here, we're just going to have them go over this form and look at it, and they will initial, the buyers will initial and date that they've seen all these pages. Now, please do not have your buyers sign here 
and sign down here if there's nothing in here. This extra spot is, it says amended disclosure form. Once this has been filled out on that specific date by the buyers and sellers, if there's any modifications or changes to it, the seller will come in here and make that modification, an amended disclosure, saying, oh, since then we did have another leak, or oh, since then we have fixed such and such. They can make that disclosure. Then they sign it. Then the buyer acknowledges this additional change. Now, if you, ever have, if you have a seller that has a lot of changes or there's a big problem that happened, take out the old property disclosure, do a brand new one until it sells. If you have enough changes on there, then once that's signed, we need to keep a copy of that. It's very important that we have this at least three days prior to closing. It takes three days to close with the, if there's a loan, so we don't have to worry about that too much. But if somebody's trying to close on a property in less than three days' time, the law says they must waive their opportunity to verify all this information. Okay? Any questions on this particular property disclosure form? The RE26 is one for new construction. This form has those three same questions on it that were up above, and pretty much not a whole lot more. Then we just have the sellers and the buyers sign that, and if there's any dis amended disclosure that needs to be made, they'll typically attach that to it or have something else here, and then sign it again. So that's new construction. I'm going to show you briefly a form which I don't want you to use. You're saying, why are you showing us? This is the exemption form. There are certain things that a seller may be exempt. And this is what they are. But what does it hurt, even if they are exempt from filling something out for a seller, if they have paid a bill for their grandparents and they know that they replaced the roof? Would you rather not disclose that that was done versus later on somebody saying, oh, you knew that the roof was replaced and we're going to sue you because of that. Well, I'd rather tell them now that, yes, the roof was replaced because I know about it from my grandparents or from my parents or whoever, and it was done so many years ago or whatever. And then it's already, it's not a problem. They can inspect it if they want to. It's better to over-disclose, in my opinion, than under-disclose. Okay. The buyer representation agreement, the RE14. And I'm sorry we do not have all those papers down here yet, so you can follow around with me. But here we put the date. You'd put your name there as the agent, the buyer's names, and they retain whom? They retain the broker. So you'd put my name down, Mike Johnston, Michael James Johnston, that super cool broker we have, whatever you want to put there. Normally the name. Broker of, then put the full company name, Keller Williams Realty East Idaho, in that order. Who has good eyes and would like to read that section right there? Morgan? All right. So, broker of Keller Williams has an exclusive buyer broker, here and after referred to as broker, where the buyer is represented by one broker only for a time period set forth for the express purpose of representing the buyer and purchase lease for optioning of real estate reference below. Okay, so up to there, they're hiring the broker and the agent to represent them. And it says based on the information below. So we're going to narrow, narrow our scope here in just a minute. Okay, keep going. Further, buyer agrees, warrants, and acknowledges that the buyer is not and shall not enter in any buyer's representation agreement with another broker in the state of Idaho as a broker for buyer during the effective term of this agreement, unless otherwise agreed to in writing by the buyer and above listed broker. Okay, so here we have people that say, oh, you have a buyer representation agreement too, and we have two out there. The buyer hopefully is smart enough to not enter into multiple buyer representation agreements. We are asked to always ask that buyer if we're working with them, have you, are you represented by somebody else? They typically say no. Have you signed any documents with another agent? Like make an offer on a property or something like that? Well, we did, but it didn't go through. Well, do you remember this other form? We need to find out if they have something. But if we've asked all those questions and they say no, this right here is supposed to protect us because they should disclose to us. 
but most of the people don't read that line to their buyers. So we're trying to make sure that we're not having a problem. Okay, let's, we're, we've got this sign. Well, we've gone through that part. Keep reading, Morgan. All right, buyer agrees to identify and hold above listed broker harmless from the claim brought by any other broker or real estate salesperson for compensation claim or owed during the effective term of this agreement. Okay. So here, let's say that Fred at XYZ Realty has a buyer representation agreement too. And we did ask all those questions and this person said, no, 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 no. And it turns out to be it was a three-year contract and blah, 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 blah. So the person forgot or who knows what. This is supposed to protect us because they would be responsible for anything along those lines if they honestly were deceptive to us or whatever. It doesn't happen very often. We'll try to make sure we get things figured out. Keep going. By appointing broker as buyer's exclusive agent, buyer agrees to conduct all negotiations for property through broker and to refer broker all inquiries received in any form of real estate broker, salesperson, prospective sellers, or any other source during the time of this buyer representation agreement is in effect. Okay. So there, if it's a for sale by owner, they're saying that they'll contact, they'll go through you. If it's a builder, they're saying they're going to go through you. Anybody approaches them, hey, I'm working with somebody else. If they go to an open house, whatever, they're supposed to say that. I like to read this paragraph to the buyers before they sign it. So many of us just say, oh, I need you to sign this, and everybody's signing stuff really quick. It's a serious document. We need to explain it a little bit more to our people. Then it says, buyer desires to purchase, lease, or obtain, or option the real estate described below. Here's where we start to describe what property that we're going to help them with. Residential, residential income, commercial, vacant land, or a custom build job, or other. What are the most common that we would mark? Typically, it's going to be the residential. It's been having a hard time, this form simplicity, the instant or whatever it is. Form simplicity, so it's not clicking. But typically, I'll mark residential. Now, residential, in, so that's single family homes. Residential income could be duplex, triplex, fourplex. Commercial, vacant land, a custom build job, or other. Right now, the people might not be thinking about building something. But I'd probably still mark it just in case they change their mind. So I'd mark that and possibly custom build job. Now we can narrow down to cities, counties, or other descriptions. There are some agents that put all, all, all on this. Are you going to go to the other side of the state and show them properties in Boise? No. How about Northern Idaho? No. Some people put on here other under other description, those properties listed in the Snake River Regional Multiple Listing Service. Well, that could be still a large area. Maybe you want to put it down by counties. They want to be in Jefferson, Madison, Fremont, maybe Bonneville, go to, or Bingham. Maybe they want to go down to Pocatello, so Bannock. You could put down the county. Well, maybe you want to narrow it down a little bit more. You could put it down to be the city, Idaho Falls, Iona, Ammon. Or maybe you want to put other description, price, geographic area. Could be within the boundaries of Thunder Ridge High School. Whatever the person needs. Maybe they're working with the police department. They need to be within the city limits of that city. Whatever it is that you want to narrow your scope down. Don't have it be such a big thing. Okay, any questions on that? Why? Well, if you put down that you're going to cover the whole state or the whole area, then you're obligating yourself to go to those other areas on behalf of this person. And we don't always have that knowledge. And later on in here, it talks a little bit about that, that we don't know about all these other things. Okay? <clears throat> Terms of the agreement. How long does it normally take you to find a buyer of property if they're looking for a residential single-family home? I think you could find something within three months probably. But what if it takes a little bit longer? It would be good to say, okay, let's put down a six-month time frame for a buyer representation agreement. You could do less, but I'd probably say six months would be adequate. And once it's done, it's done. Because once we find the property, we can terminate this. It's, it can be over if we've done what they'd want it. It's easier now to negotiate something a little bit longer than it is to come back later on. Just like with the listing. Somebody says, oh, 
I only want to do a three-month listing. Well, if you do the average days on the market for that particular property and it says it takes four months, do you want to have a three-month listing if the average is four months? No. So it's typically better to go with a longer time frame than less. Broker representations and services. The broker and broker's agent representing a buyer are agents of the buyer. Broker will use reasonable efforts as buyer's agent to locate property as described in section one hereof from the information available in the multiple listing service and from other sources for unlisted property that the broker may be aware of when applicable as set forth in section one. Now we can go through and read all this stuff. It's gonna take a long time, so we're not gonna read everything. But just be careful. If they want you to look for for sale by owners, great. They want you to knock doors because it's maybe it's a certain geographic area for a, a grade school and they want to live in that grade school. Maybe you're going to have to knock doors, but define it on there. If you're going to knock the doors and you're going to approach for sell by owners that you'd be compensated for that. Transaction related service disclaimer. There's been lawsuits where we have made recommendations to people and said, oh, I think you should use ABC plumbing or XYZ lawn care. Well, if we make, thank you, we'll, we'll just send them, hand them to all these great people. And that way, it says when we make a recommendation to somebody, that's simply what it is, a recommendation. You're not forced to utilize that particular company or that person. You can choose somebody else. But it's somebody for a start. We've had good working relationships with them. Financial information. If you're going to represent a buyer, you need to know their financial situation so you can present that true picture to the other people. There are times when maybe you don't want to represent a buyer. You're not required to fill out a buyer representation agreement. You're not. And if this person is wanting to be very secretive or is not forthcoming sharing information with you so that you can represent that buyer, then maybe you don't want to. Because if you're going to say, yeah, these people are great, we've got them pre-approved, all this other type of stuff, and all you heard was some information, you don't know a whole lot about it, you could be causing some problems. If you ever feel uncomfortable with a buyer, if you ever have that feeling, maybe you don't want to represent them, it's okay. You can treat them as a customer. But if you're getting along great, things are going good, you're getting the information that you need, then it's fine to also represent them as a client. Other potential buyers. Buyers understand that other potential buyers may consider make offers on or purchase through the broker the same or similar properties as the buyer is seeking to acquire. Buyer consents to the broker representation of such other potential buyers before, during, and after the expiration of this agreement and further releases the broker of any conflicting agency duties. So I'm out showing homes between 100 and, and no, between 150 and one. 90 tonight and I'm showing two different groups of people the first group I show it to love home number one and they think it's the best thing since sliced bread so they want this home and they want to think about it they'll get back to me a little bit later on so now I'm with the second group and same price range oh I, I shouldn't show that first home to those people because they kind of have their eye on it and they kind of want it am I really representing the second group well no so this paragraph is talking about that. Until we have an offer, until something happens, if I'm still working with people that have a desire to look at that, I'm gonna show it to them. What's really bad, and it's happened to me, is when you have two people that like the same property and they both wanna write up an offer on it, and it's very difficult because you can't share between those two buyers what to write up. And it's even worse if it's your listing, okay? So be cautious with that. They'd initial and date that bottom of the page. The top of the next page, they'd put the buyer's names again. Limits of confidentiality of offers. Buyer understands that an offer submitted to a seller and the terms thereof may not be held confidential by such seller or seller's representative unless such confidentiality is otherwise agreed to by the parties. I've seen agents write down in paragraph four on the purchase and sell agreement, seller to hold this information confidential and not, and not disclose it to anybody else. Sounds pretty good, right? But they haven't, hasn't been signed, hasn't been agreed to. A lot of sellers or sometimes agents that are working with the sellers, when they get an offer, they might disclose it to everybody else. Say, hey guys, I got an offer for 75,000 on that lot over on such and such. 
I'm presenting at six o'clock tonight. If you guys have anything else, let me know. It's going to have to be above that if you want it. Is that okay? Can I do that? Technically, I could. There's some repercussions. Some people might not like it, but I'm working for my seller, so I'm mentioning that. Even if it says on a paragraph not to disclose it, I haven't agreed to it. The agent has agreed to it. The seller or the the seller who's getting that hasn't agreed to it. So be very cautious. If you're going to have a non-disclosure, it's signed before you present anything. And we typically don't do that, but sometimes it could happen. Consent to limited dual representation and assigned agency. So this whole next paragraph is talking about the option that these buyers have to be represented by you 100% or to be an assigned agent or the limited dual without assigned agents. Sometimes we get confused. And now in our packet that we have here, I have, let's turn back here. So this is the part that I want you to be able to see. Well, it's actually on the purchase and sell agreement, so it's not on this one yet. On the purchase and sell agreement, I'll go through and explain the situation of how to mark those forms, A, B, C, and then A, B, C for those two different sections, who's representing who, and it goes through every different scenario that's possible to help you. So here, if your buyer says that they do not want to have an opportunity to look at other Keller Williams listings, because that would mean single agency is what they'd want, you couldn't show them any Keller Williams properties if you're going to represent them 100%. Does that make sense? Now, limited dual with assigned agency or not means you could show them Keller Williams properties and even possibly one that you have listed if they've agreed to the limited dual agency. Now, if it's not your listing and it's not a member of your team, it's another agent in the office or another team in the office, then you could have assigned agency. Now, there are some times when you can't have assigned agency. So let's say that two people on the same team, and there's one person that handles all the transactions for that office or that team. You really can't do assigned agency because that person that's doing the, the work for them, everything's known about it. And many times the team leader or the head of that team wants to know what's going on, and you can't always share certain things with that person in the event you're trying to have limited dual with assigned agency. So typically on that, it would be just a limited dual agency without a sign. Or if you have a, a person that's handling the files for you, let's say that you're hiring Shauna to do it, and the listing agent has hired Shauna, well then technically we, can, we shouldn't have the assigned agency there because she is getting documents from both sides and could say something to one of the other parties and disclose something that she shouldn't. So be cautious on that. But in our office, we're big enough that we can have assigned agency most of the time. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the purchase and sell agreement. So if it's ever single agency, it means you're not going to show any Keller Williams properties to people, okay? Non-discrimination, we're not gonna discriminate for any reason. Severability clause, if for some reason one of these paragraphs is considered invalid or voidable or not, correct, it would be severed, taken out of the contract, and all the other paragraphs we would keep. Singular and plural, if it says I and it should say we, or it says we and it should say I, we're agreeing that that's okay in the contract. Default attorney's fees, in the event the default by the buyer under this agreement, broker shall be entitled to the fee that the broker would have received had no default occurred, in addition to the other available legal remedies. In the event of any suit or other proceeding arising out of this agreement, the prevailing party shall be entitled to its reasonable attorney's fees and all costs incurred relate relative to such suit or proceeding, including fees and costs upon appeal. And it goes on and on. Earnest money dispute interpolator. Here is where we address that if earnest money is being held and there's a conflict, that we can file an interpolator with the court. How many people know what an interpolator is? How many people know what it works? Okay. Now, with an interpolator, let's say that we have $1,000 that's held. And the parties don't come to an agreement as to what's going to happen with that earnest money. Somebody would file an interpolator with the court and say, okay, we want you, court, to decide who gets the earnest money. What they do is the court would send a document to all the people involved. So if there's two buyers, buyer, buyer, and there's two sellers, seller, seller, and there's a listing agent and a broker and a selling agent and a broker, that's eight people. 
It costs about $100 for each one of those to receive the documents, to be served, and to go through the process. And that money comes out of the, out of the <coughs> earnest money. So if we have $1,000, now we have $800 less. So we have $200 we're dealing with. The contractor, the document that goes to them says, please explain why you feel that you or who should receive the earnest money. And everybody pleads their case. The court, typically a judge or somebody else, gets that information and goes through it all, looks at the contract itself, and makes a decision as to who should get it. If they feel that the buyer should get it, they only have $200 now, so say, okay, the money goes to the buyer, $200. Or, oh, the seller should get it. Is that $200? Because that's all that's left. Goes to them. Or, oh, we're going to split it, $100 each. What I've done, I've never had to file an interpleader. I've been asked to before, but I've typically told them, I'll just hold it until you guys decide what you're going to do. Because instead of having $200, you'd still have the 1000 and at that point in time, many people say, okay, instead of the other person filing the interpolator because they don't think anyone's going to get the money, let's just split it. So 500 and 500 is better than potential of 200 or 200 or 100, 100 or nothing. Do okay? you as the broker go over that with them? I try to explain that to the people when I fill out a contract with them because everybody, not everybody, most people are told by their agent or they feel that if I don't get this property, I'll get the earnest money back. Or the seller feels that, oh, if the buyer's back out, I get the earnest money. Well, it's not that clear cut. I'll explain that there's, right at the beginning, there's some contingencies. So here's the time frame from today when we write up the offer to where we close. At the beginning, if it doesn't, if we don't get our financing within that 10 days, or we, it doesn't pass the inspections, typically, and I don't say always, I say typically, you'd get your earnest money back if I'm talking to the buyer. Then there's that gray period, and then we get right before closing. If you back out the day of closing, the seller's going to want the earnest money. They've moved out of the home or all these other things already. Then most likely they'd get it. But in between that is the gray period. It depends what happens. And I can't guarantee you that you'll get the earnest money back because all parties to the transaction, the buyer and the sellers, need to sign to release that. So earnest money is that. It could be lost. You're serious enough that you want to buy this property that you're willing to lose this money in the case you default. But that's one of the big things that I get phone calls about is people are concerned about the earnest money. They feel that they should get it and it hasn't happened or it's been three months and it hasn't been released yet because the other party won't release it. Compensation. This is the part that many people mark wrong. And I'll explain why I say Mark wrong. If you're willing to do all these things for this potential buyer and you put on here zero for compensation, zero if you work with a for sale by owner, zero if you work with a builder, you have all this obligation to do stuff. You're a plastic surgeon and you're guaranteeing that you're gonna do all this work for this person, make sure that they're happy for zero. No. Compensation the broker. In consideration of the services to be performed by the broker, the buyer agrees that the broker may be compensated in any of the following ways. Check all that apply. Mark A, if the property is subject to a listing agreement with the broker's company or a cooperating broker through the multiple listing service, MLS or otherwise, the fee will be the amount equal to the compensation offered by the aforementioned brokers, but not less than blank percent of the selling price. Buyer agrees to pay the broker any difference between the amount received from the aforementioned brokers and the stated minimum. So, who knows what our company policy is? It's 3%. So, if we put 3% here and it turns out to be that it's listed on the MLS and it shows that you're going to get 3%, everything's fine, right? What if it shows 2.5% is what the other side's going to share with you? And our company policy, and you have down here on 3, is 3. The buyer could be obligated to pay that difference of a half a percent. Typically, we don't worry about it. We're not going to force them. The broker's not going to say, hey, Morgan, you know, it only gave us two and a half percent, but you should have got three, so we have to get that. No. If we don't want to get that difference, we don't have to. All right? But what if something's put into the MLS and it says we're going to pay one dollar? It could be put into the MLS that way. This right here would protect you 
just in case your buyer your buyers could say okay if 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 you're not if it's not going to be paid for by the other side then i don't want you to show it to us if you have that written down then you're okay otherwise you're obligated to show them even if it shows zero on there for compensation for you to show things through the mls and if you put zero on here then you're doing it for free so is that a good way to word it is when you're talking with your buyers is to say typically mm -hmm. the you know the which I just say, when, when a property is listed, the seller typically will put down a percentage of what they're going to share with the agent that brings in the buyer. And that's disclosed to us so we know that we're going to be compensated. There are times, however, that maybe they're not going to compensate us. And I, I talk about the whole paragraph, like with a for sale by owner or with a builder. I'm always going to go and talk to the other party first for them to pay the fee. But if they're not going to, I will inform you that you would be obligated in this particular offer to compensate me. Are you okay with that? Yes. So that's A. B, if the property is not subject to a listing agreement, such as a forced sell by owner or a custom build job, the buyer agrees <clears throat> that the broker will be paid a fee not less than blank percent of the selling price or a flat dollar fee. The broker shall first seek to obtain this fee through the transaction paid by the seller. If the fee cannot be obtained through the seller, the buyer will be responsible for such fee stated above. So if I'm looking at a for sale by owner, I'll call them up on the phone. I'll let them know, hey, this is Mike Johnston with Keller Williams Realty East Idaho. I have some buyers that would like to look at your property. In the event that they like your property and we do put together an offer, would you pay my fee to do the transaction? Typically, they'll say, well, well that's why I'm doing it on my own. Well, I would be available to assist you in writing up the offer. Well, I'd write up the offer and I'd explain it and have the forms and things that are necessary. I'd guide both parties through the transaction. So inspections, appraisals, and other things would be done. I'd make sure that you were aware of what the closing costs were at closing and keep you informed of all those other things and the obligations that you have to make disclosures as per Idaho law. Instead of you hiring an, uh, instead of you hiring, uh, an attorney or somebody, for those things that would be included in this particular fee. Would you be okay with that? Well, many times they are and you come to some agreement of what you're going to be compensated for and then you're fine. If they say no, then basically they are on their own. There's no one that's negotiating, of course, on their behalf and typically you wouldn't. You wouldn't get a listing. It would be a compensation agreement. You do represent your buyer, but you're facilitating or helping. So, it's possible to do that. It's possible to get paid. So explain that to them. Three, if the property is leased, we're not gonna deal with leases right now, but you can use this for leasing. Retainer fee, buyer will pay the broker a non-refundable retainer fee of X number of dollars due and payable upon signing of this agreement. Retainer fee shall or shall not be credited against any compensation set forth in paragraph A or B. So if they want to retain you, they could pay you $500 that you could be their agent in case they needed you for certain things. And then when if they were to use you and you're compensated under A or B through a commission, that $500 could be subtracted from the total amount that you receive later on. It still counts as commission income, so it would come in that way. But when the whole amount comes in, you've already received a percentage of that. That's not used very often, but it could be. And then D e, e is the hourly rate. Buyer will pay the broker at a rate of X number of dollars per hour for the time spent by the broker pursuant to this agreement to be paid when billed whether or not the buyer acquires or leases property. The fee shall or shall not be credited against any compensation as set forth in paragraph A, B, or C. You could be a consultant. Somebody wants to know information about a subdivision. They want to do certain things. You could be hired on an hourly basis. It's still commission income. Okay. This compensation shall apply to transactions made for which the buyer enters into a contract during the original term of this agreement or during any extension of such original or extended term and shall also apply to transactions for which the buyer enters into a contract within blank 90 days, calendar days, after this agreement expires or is terminated. If the property acquired or leased by the buyer was submitted in writing to the buyer by the broker pursuant to section one hereof during the original term or execution of this term of this agreement, blah, 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 blah. In the event that purchase, the buyer purchases any property as described in section one above without using the representation of the broker name, a 
above within the time frame this agreement remains in force. Above stated buyer shall be liable to the broker for a cancellation fee equal to blank percent of the selling price of the property acquired or a flat dollar figure. Put down 1% or put down $500, $750 or something. And again, it's more for a conversation. We've collected it before, yes, and we've given it up other times. But if you have a buyer that is really causing some pain and they want to get out of it, they walk around you and you've done everything that you need to do and you have zero thing for a cancellation fee and you really did earn something, if we have it, had it in writing, then you can go after that to get that. And we show this to the closing agency. It's a valid contract and they should put it on to the closing, even though you're not involved with it anymore, that they are to pay you a fee. I've had that happen and we've collected it. Okay. Other terms and conditions, communication, failure of the buyer to reasonably maintain communication with the brokers of breach of this agreement, transmission of the documents. We're going to send things back and forth electronically, fax, whatever, that can work. Wire transfer warning, don't wire funds. Authority of signatory, if the buyer is a corporation, partnership, trust, estate, or whatever, they will provide the documentation that we need to prove that they are able to sign on their behalf. Merger and time is of the essence of this agreement work on things quickly. So buyer sign and then the agent or broker would sign here. Any questions with the buyer representation agreement? That one's kind of boring but has some important things that we need to have in there. Okay. Our next one is the purchase and sell agreement. The time you've all been waiting for. The RE21. We want to make sure that we know what we can do with this. Now we have the RE21, the RE22, RE23, the RE24 all these different contracts. Now, if it's a commercial property, do you have to use the commercial purchase and sell agreement? No. If it's a new construction, do you have to use the pre-sell form? No. If it's vacant land, do you have to use, you see a pattern here, do you have to use the vacant land form? No. If you feel very comfortable with the RE21, the main form that we typically use, and it has the terms and things that you feel are necessary, you can use it for vacant land. You can use it for new construction. You can use it for commercial. You can use it for all the different things that you're doing. However, a commercial agent that does a lot of commercial stuff is probably going to use the commercial form because he or she is more comfortable with that form. It has different verbiage. It was prepared by the Idaho Association of Realtors, the Idaho Realtors, for commercial people. Same thing with the vacant land. Same thing with the uh, uh, new construction. There's a reason for these different forms. You need to get to know them if you're going to use them. But most of the time, the RE21 will work fine for most situations. So the RE21. <clears throat> On the top, we'll put down an ID number and the date. And in your paper here, I kind of show you how... I come up with an idea for the ID number. I have some agents that say they're going to number every single one of their offers they ever write up so they know how many they wrote. My brother Greg knows how many he's written up. It's pretty interesting. He's written up a bunch. So you can put year, November, and all that type of stuff, and your initials, whatever you want to do. You can choose that. Some of the forms will automatically generate a number for you. Other programs don't, so it just depends. Listing agency. I'm not going to teach you in this class today how this can be imported from the MLS through the forms company. That's a whole other class, but some of this information can be imported, so you'd have to put down the listing agency, the agent's name, the legal description, what's included, excluded. Certain things could get imported into it, so that's a different class. So here we'll put down the listing agency, office phone number. You don't have to put down the facts and all that other stuff. I typically want you to put down the listing agency and the listing agent. That's all that I would require. We don't want them to call the listing agent if we're working with the buyers, right? We want them to contact us. Selling agency, that would be us, so Keller Williams Realty East Idaho, and then selling agent you. Now with teams, <clears throat> it says agent. It doesn't say team. They want to know who they're going to be contacting. So whoever the point of contact is, is who's supposed to be there. Now, the Real Estate Commission says under the listing side, they're permitting it to show a team name. 
because you may not know when you list it who exactly that you're supposed to be dealing with. So they'll let that be imported. But if you know, then put down who that person is. Selling agent. Make sure you put down you if you're the one that's going to be dealing or the point of contact for this particular transaction. There have been some times when people will put down two people. They could put down Morgan Peterson because you're on his team slash Fred Flintstone. You know, your name there. That way it has both people's names on there. You could do that. Otherwise, you typically would put your name. Buyers. Here's where you want to find out how they legally want to take title to the property. John Q. Smith. Or is it going to be John Quincy Smith? Or is it just John Smith? Now, if you just put down the simple names, many times they're going to have to sign documents later on that says also known as and go through tons of stuff. Whenever I buy something or I do something, my full legal name is what I use, Michael James Johnston. That way I don't have to do all these AKAs or aliases. And it's not a problem for loans. And when they pull credit report based on the name only, they're not finding the guy in Pocatello that has a Michael Johnston who was defaulted on certain things. He actually lives in Blackfoot. Anyway, so find out how they want to take title. Put those names down. The second thing, the title company likes it when we can put down, like Michael James Johnston and Shannon P. Johnston, comma, husband and wife. If they are married, put that down. The title company likes to know that. Or two single individuals. Or one's the mom and one's the son buying the property. Or they're just friends buying an investment property. Put down and specify who these individuals are. It could be two married people, married to other people, purchasing sole and separate property. Then it says, buying the property commonly known as. This is where we put down the address, 123 North Main Street. Now, the lenders, if you type it down wrong, they're going to have to have you correct it with an addendum later on. So as a listing agent, make sure you have the correct legal, I mean, correct legal as well, but also the correct address. So you put that down. City, county, it's in Idaho because that's all we can do is do stuff in Idaho and the zip code. Legally described as, and we put the legal. Now, typically the listing agent will have the correct legal for you, but sometimes they put down the wrong one or they'll put down township range and all this other stuff which you don't need. If it's in a subdivision, all you need is lot one, block two, such and such subdivision number two or three addition or whatever it is. If it says township range, the TS, all our quarter of this and the longer description, you don't need that if it's in a subdivision. If it is a a legal description that's meets and bounds, starting at this point, going here, so many feet, it's probably not going to fit on those two lines. So you can mark on here, or legal description attached as exhibit blank. Typically, exhibit A. The title company will send over, if you order a profile, the legal description. And it will say, beginning at this point, and it's a long legal. If the legal description just says lot and block, you should be able to put that down simply. If not, attach it as an exhibit. The listing agent should have gotten one for you if it's long like that and put it into the included documents and had the seller's initial or sign it. You would initial and sign it for you. Your people would do that same thing. Any questions on legals? I've had agents argue with me when they get a printout from the tax assessor's office that says a portion of. I'd like you to draw that off for me. A portion of a certain lot. Or 13,000 square feet of. Can you draw that off? No or half acre. Draw that one off for me. If it doesn't make sense, it's not a valid legal description. Purchase price. Put down the price. Then it says this offer is contingent upon the sell, refinance, and or closing of another property. Yes or no? Well, sometimes people say that this is an all cash offer and it's really not. Your sellers would like to know that. So it's going to ask several different questions here in different ways to make sure that we're making the correct disclosure. So is this offer contingent upon the sell, refinance, or closing of another property? No. I already have the cash. Okay. Then they can say no. Financial terms. Earnest money. How much are they putting down? And explain to your buyers that it's possibly they could lose it. Then we have the four paragraphs. Evidence by cash. You could take cash. I don't recommend it. Personal check. That's better. A cashier's check would be even better. Wire transfer, I don't like to get involved with the wire. A note, that's meaning a promissory note, or other. 
I don't like it when they put down other and it's a an handgun or title to a car. It's possible to do that. In the back in the day, we did that. Normally now we don't. I used to have to keep stuff in a locked lock box type thing, guns, title. I had people want to give me animals before and I said no. <laughs> somebody wanted to give me a car to use. I didn't want to have it there in case somebody wrecked into it. <clears throat> so held by the responsible broker, closing company, or other. Typically, we're going to have a personal check. If they do a cashier's check, it would be better. We're one of the few states that don't require the funds to be really good. We still accept a check. And then it has to wait 10 business days to clear. Held by the responsible broker closing company. We typically have the closing company hold it. Or other. Other could be the builder. Could be the seller. Delivered with the offer within blank business days, three if left blank, of acceptance or other. Typically, we will mark down that it's going to be delivered with the offer. We're collecting it at that time. If for some reason you're not and they're going to bring it in later, you better make sure that they bring it in and turn it in later. When I'm writing up an offer, I tell the people to bring in their checkbook at that point in time. And then I'll make sure it gets to the title company. Deposited upon receipt and acceptance, upon receipt regardless of acceptance or other. If you know that they're going to mail it and it's going to take a little bit longer, you could either mark here delivered within so many business days or it's going to be deposited by, and you can put down a certain date here, and give them five days. We have to be very cautious with that. And you, the agent writing up this offer, have to make sure that if it says it's going to be deposited by a certain date, that you verify that. Otherwise, you have caused a breach in the contract. The seller can back out and accept that backup offer, which came in two days later for $10,000 more. So they're really wanting yours to fall out of the way, and they're looking for any reason to do so. You have to make sure that it gets there, and you need to get a receipt to put into our file that shows the date and time and who received that at the title company. That's what's the receipt of earnest money. Receipt of earnest money is not a copy of the check. It's a copy of a piece of paper that says it was received by ABC Title Company on this date at this time. The responsible broker shall be. Now it says broker, doesn't say brokerage. A brokerage is a business name. Voight Davis Better Homes and Gardens. Remax Prestige. Keller Williams Realty East Idaho. That's a brokerage. They want a person to be responsible. So typically it's going to be Leanne Neal, Mike Johnston, could be Darren Long. It's going to be a person's name from that brokerage. So you, writing an offer up, are always going to have me be your responsible broker. If you ever have an offer written up and they put me down as a responsible broker and they're from another brokerage firm, no, no. We want their broker to be responsible. I don't want to be responsible for them. We have some offices out of Teton and other places that typically put down the other office to be have the responsible broker. And I don't want to be responsible for somebody I don't even know. Okay? All cash offer, they're asking it again, yes or no. And if this is an all cash offer, do not complete sections 3C and D fill in the blanks with zero. If cash offer, buyer's obligation to close shall not be subject to any financial contingency. So if I'm saying it's an all cash offer, but I have to get the funds out of a mutual fund, I could say it's a, an all cash offer, but I'm going to have to disclose that it's coming from that because it's coming from somewhere else. It's a contingency. I must have it come out of that in order for me to close. Otherwise, it's not really an all cash offer. I don't have the cash yet. Down here it says buyer agrees to provide seller within blank business days five from the date of acceptance of this agreement by all parties, written confirmation of sufficient funds and or proceeds necessary. It could be, but not limited to a copy of a recent bank or financial statement. This last week, we had a forged document of a, from a bank here in town that said they had so much money in their account. That's not good. So we put the home back on the market because that person, we can't find them anymore. But there will be a, the bank is going after them for forging documents. So normally we'll have an accurate document. You can call to verify that that person did actually write that letter. You want it on their stationery, their letterhead or something that can show that. You don't want it just to be a printout of the screen that shows they have money. 
And if you're the one providing that information, you don't want to have the account numbers and other stuff on there, social security numbers. So there's a lot of confidential things. So let the bank write the letter, let the buyer provide it so we can give that to the seller. New loan proceeds. This agreement is contingent upon the buyers obtaining the following financing. First loan of X number of dollars, not including mortgage insurance, and then they'll mark down the different types of loans. If you're getting a loan or you're not sure with your buyer if it's going to be a conventional or an FHA loan, put down the tougher of the two, which would be tougher, conventional or FHA. FHA, because there could be some costs associated with that to the seller. In the fine print in that next paragraph, you can switch your loans types as long as it does not affect the seller for cost. So if you mark FHA and you change it to a conventional, you'll be okay. If you mark conventional and you're gonna change it to an FHA, you must get permission from the seller if you're gonna change the terms. So that's why we want our buyers to be approved ahead of time. And we already know if we need the seller to pay closing costs, we already know what type of loan it's going to be. We already know all those things. So take the time up front to get to know your buyer and make sure that we know what, what it is that we need to put down. Otherwise, if you keep going back and going through things with those other people and trying to renegotiate because you had to change a loan type, they could get out. The people could back out because they don't want to keep dealing with that. So that's the first loan or other with interest rate not to exceed a certain percent. Talk to your lender. If your lender says they're getting a loan for 4.5%, bump it up to 5 So there's a little bit of wiggle room. It says not to exceed. If you put 4.5% and they can't get 4.5%, then yes, your buyers could get out. But they should lock in as soon as they get that loan approval <coughs> and they get everything. Some people don't and they say, oh, I'm going to just watch it. And then it goes up and then they want to get out. Well, our job is to make sure that once we have a, an offer, we get a copy of this to the other lend, to the lender and say, hey, get them locked in so we know that we're good to go. For a period of so many years, fixed rate or other, loan application, oh, it has a second as well if you're going to do a second on there. When would you have a second loan on a property? If you're getting a new loan, why would you have a first and a second? Does that happen? Okay, there are some down payment assistance programs. In Pocatello, they have a program called the Pocatello Neighborhood Housing Services. Here they have a program called the Good Neighbor or Good Finally Home, or I don't know what it is, but there's a loan program which helps them with the first time home buyers. They get the first loan for 80%. The second loan can be for 15% or 10%. And the buyer either comes in with 5% or 10%. The reason they have those that first loan of 80% is because there's no mortgage insurance premium that's required if you have that. So they have the 80% and then the other loans on top of that. So it saves the buyer money. Instead of putting money towards the, uh, what's it called? I just said it. Mortgage insurance premium, MIP or PMI, it can go towards that other payment. So that's why there might be a first and a second. Loan application buyer has applied or shall apply for such loan. Within blank business days, 10 if left blank of final acceptance of all parties, buyer agrees to furnish the seller with a written confirmation showing. Now, this is what we're not doing. Not everybody's doing this. And in a market where there's competing offers, make sure you do this. Furnish the seller a written confirmation showing lender approval of credit report, income verification, debt ratios, and evidence of sufficient funds and or proceeds necessary to close the transaction in a manner acceptable to the sellers and subject only to satisfactory appraisal and final lender underwriting. If an appraisal is required by the lender, the property must appraise it not less than the purchase price or the buyer's earnest money shall be refund, refunded at the buyer's request. Unless the seller at the seller's sole discretion agrees to reduce the purchase price to meet the appraised value. Okay, so within 10 days, we need to provide a letter to the sellers, and the only two things that it can be on there, it can't say, oh, we're waiting for verification of pay stubs, or oh, as long as other things don't change. It has to say they're approved. They've taken care of everything except for final lender underwriting and a satisfactory appraisal. Those are the only two things. So if you're working with the seller and you get a lender, a letter from a, a buyer, and it has more than just those two things on it, right then and there, you could say, okay, this is not an, an acceptable letter. We're going to terminate this contract and take that backup offer. 
Make sure the backup offer is good before you cancel this first one, but it could happen. So you need to make sure that you're dealing with your lender and say, are you going to be able to write this letter and have it be only saying these two things on there? If so, then we have an, an acceptable letter. Well, our company requires this. Well, we typically show them this right here ahead of time before we're even dealing with that lender and say, can you write a letter like this? And they get it approved that they can do it, but they want to make sure that it take a little bit more time before they can write that letter. Okay, that's some of the tougher stuff on this form so far. Then everybody's going to go ahead and initial and date that. This next part, we talked about that appraisal. So if the offer comes in and it doesn't appraise for the amount that's offered, what do you do? The seller can lower down, like it said on here, the seller, if they lower it down, then your buyer is obligated to continue to go through the, the transaction. If the seller is not willing to do it, then your buyer can either back out, they're out the cost of the appraisal and other stuff already, but they could back out or they could pay the difference as long as their lender is okay with them paying that difference if they can still qualify. Some sellers are going to try to get another appraisal done to try to get that value there. It's happened many times that there's, they didn't get the last addendum. The appraiser didn't. And if they don't get the last addendum that shows that it's up $4,000 more, many times the appraiser doesn't want to put their neck out on a chopping block and say it's worth more and have everybody be upset when the price they thought was this. They just has, have to substantiate at least the amount that was on the contract. So we've had a case a couple weeks ago where they didn't get the addendum that said it was a higher amount and the appraiser just did it for the amount that was on the contract of what they received. So now the buyer says, well, why would we show them this to increase it? We want it to be low. Well, that's true. You want it to be low, but you're not gonna, the seller's not going to reduce it to that amount for $3,000. So it's up to you what you want to do. So be very cautious with that. Make sure that you give all the documents to the lender and the appraiser has all the documents so they know what they need to appraise it for. Additional financing terms. If you're going to use a contract, owner carry or something, please let me know before you write something up so I can assist you. You can't have an owner carry if there's a loan on it already that's not assumable. Most loans that are out there have a due on sale clause and acceleration clause because a lender doesn't want somebody else to take over their payments. Prior to 1983, I think, most of the loans were assumable that you could just go in and take over those payments. Back in the day on the MLS, you, you'd know how much the loan was. Oh, this property has a first loan of X number of dollars at 7% interest rate. Ooh, seven's a great rate because it was 15 or so. So they, they advertise that. So you could take over and assume that payment, and then you paid the difference to the seller. So you wrapped the loans, and that was okay back then. But then there were problems because the people that bought these other loans, or not bought the loans, that assumed those loans didn't pay the debts. And that first party who was on the contract was the one that was obligated for it. But somebody else is making the payment. So problems arose. So that was a simple assumption. That's a simple assumption loan. Formal assumption loans are those that, yeah, you could take over this at this payment, but you have to credit qualify. And then it takes it out of their name and puts it into your name. And we could see that on some lower mortgages, like 3%, if it goes up to 9 or 10% again. We could see people trying to simply assume some of the other loans. Right now, not necessary. We're still doing okay. All right? So that would be the additional financing terms. Approximate funds due from buyers at closing, all those numbers are calculated through the computer if you use it online and they're approximate. Other terms and or conditions. Here is where you put down certain things and I turn to our page here and it talks about paragraph four, other terms and conditions. In this paragraph, you could place terms dealing with subject to the sell and closing of the buyer's property located at 123 Main Street in any town, Idaho, currently listed with Alan Jones with Keller Williams Realty East Idaho. This is not where you'd put down sellers to pay part of the buyer's closing costs. It goes in a different part. Other terms can go here. You could put something down subject to the buyers actually looking at the property because they wrote an offer on it without seeing it by such and such a date and time. Always, if you're going to have a contingency, put down 
a date and time when it must be met. You can always write up an offer that's subject to these people seeing the home or their spouse seeing the home or their parents approving of it by a certain date, if that's what they want. Oh, I can't write up an offer until my, my spouse comes here from New York because they're working. Well, this home's not going to be on the market. We could write it up subject to them looking at it and find a decent time frame when that would happen. Now, I mentioned about subject to the sale of a home. If you're representing the buyer and it's not one of our company listings, it would be okay to put down subject to the sale and closing of this property. If it happens to be at one of our listings or you know they're, they're going to counter back and use the RE, uh, seven, not 17, RE, um, mind blank. No, that's counter. The, the seller's right to, 27, seller's right to continue to market the premises and accept other offers because that way the sellers can keep the home on the market. If an offer comes in, then it triggers the time frame. And we'll talk about that form later. Items included and excluded. In here, it has a lot of different things that are considered included. Let's read those. It says, all existing fixtures and fittings that are attached to the property are included in the purchase price, unless excluded below, and shall be transferred free of liens. These include, but not, are not limited to, all seller-owned attached floor coverings, television, and wall mounts. You see people taking wall mounts all the time. We need to explain to the sellers that they're supposed to stay. Satellite dish, attached plumbing, bathroom, and lighting fixtures, window screens, storm doors, storm screen doors, storm doors, storm windows, window coverings, garage door openers and transmitters, exterior trees, plants, or shrubbery, water heating apparatus and fixtures, attached fireplace equipment, awnings, ventilation, cooling, and heating systems, all ranges, ovens, built-in dishwashers, fuel tanks, and irrigation fixtures, and equipment that are now on or used in connection with the property and shall be included in the cell unless otherwise provided therein. Okay, it said ranges. That's new as of two years ago. Before that, you always had to write down if you're going to include the range and oven. So right now, it's considered included. Refrigerators are not. Coverings, draperies, blinds, they're included. But we see people taking those all the time because, oh, you didn't ask for it. It's at the fine print. It says it's there. So make sure that if you're the listing agent, that if there's something that's going to be excluded, they want to take those blinds because it has uh, trolls on it and it matches the bedspread of the little girl who likes the bedspread. So you're going to take it. Make sure that you put that down as something excluded. The chandelier in the kitchen or in the dining area. If your seller says they're going to take that, they better take it down before we start marketing the property and put something else up there that's going to stay, okay? Additional items specifically included in the cell, you'd write those down, exclude in the cell, write those down. Sometimes the lender, if you write down hot tub, because there's a hot tub outside, lenders many times are not excited about that because they say, oh, there's some value to that, and if it goes away, the appraiser's gonna give it value. Well, we've tried so hard, because on here it says, it is agreed, the last sentence on here, it says, it is agreed, that any item in this section is of nominal value less than $100. So we're trying to do that, but many lenders still want it to be removed from the purchase and sell agreement. Then your buyer saying, well, we want the hot tub, so why are we going to remove it? Then you end up having to do a bill of sell for $1 for the hot tub when it closes so that you can meet those criteria. So there's just different little things you have to be cautious about. If you put down refrigerators and other things, the lender might have a problem with it, but we can deal with it, okay? So always put down things that are excluded. If you know that the seller wants to exclude something and your buyers are okay with that, don't make them have to do a counter because if they're going to counter on something that's excluded, they'll probably counter you on price. So if you can find out ahead of time all the things that are supposed to be excluded, the dates that they want to close, the title company where they want to be, all the things that they really want, and your buyers are okay with that, and it's just the price that's different, they're more apt to sign your offer. Mineral rights, all mineral rights would stay. Water rights, if any, will stay. Now with water rights, if you find out that there's certain shares or there's certain anything that's going to be transferred, and you're the listing agent, you better make sure you have those certificates, those shares, those stocks, whatever they are, available so these people can verify it and put it down. 
if you put down that the water rights are included and it turns out to be that you advertised it that there were and you come to closing and there isn't, that's a lawsuit. So don't ever advertise if you're the listing agent that you have water rights until you actually know for sure what they are. And get that information so that you can provide that so these buyers can find out what's going on. The title company doesn't insure water rights. We've had times where the seller had to buy water rights to get to these buyers in order to close. Otherwise, they're going to be sued. And they're not always that cheap. Title conveyance, they're going to be transferred by warranty deed unless otherwise specified. If you're dealing with the relocation company, many times they're going to want to do it by a special warranty deed. If it's a tax thing, foreclosure, there's different types of deeds that could be done. A sheriff's deed, a tax deed, other things. So always verify. You want the warranty deed for your buyers because it means they're guaranteeing that they promise that they own it. Title insurance, preliminary title report will be done within six days, business days, of final acceptance, and the seller or the buyer shall pro pro provide that. Uh, the buyer shall have so many days to, if left blank, to review it to see if there's any problems. And if there's a problem, the seller has two days or other agreed upon time to get that corrected so everybody can go through with it. If you're a listing agent and you know that there's a problem with the title, like uh, someone had passed away, Start dealing with the title company up front immediately to make sure that we can get those title things confirmed and resolved. If you're dealing with an entity, make sure you have those documents that they need to have. If they don't want to share them with you, that's fine. They can share with the title company. So the title company has that information so they know what documents they need to be able to transfer the title. And you put down here who the title company is going to be located at whatever is going to provide the title policy and preliminary title report. Standard owner's policy, it explains that. Extended policy, the mortgagee policy, and that protects the mortgage company. <clears throat> Number 10, inspection. The buyer chooses to conduct an inspection or not. Sometimes your buyers, especially first-time home buyers, are going to say, oh, I don't want to pay the money for that inspection. Oh, I don't want to do it. So they say no, and you write it up that way. Then they go home and talk with their parents or other people, and the, those people say, oh, that terrible agent talked you out of doing that. Boy, you're going to have problems. Oh, yeah, yeah, they did. They talked us out of it. Yeah, yeah, you're the bad guy. I'd rather you mark to conduct inspections, and they choose not to go through it, but at least they had that opportunity. Because if they don't do it, the time frame just comes and goes. And if they don't want to and you mark that they did, they could always change their mind and their uncle, their dad, they could go through and they could have an inspection done a different way. It doesn't have to be a paid inspection. But the inspection covers some other things that we need to know. A buyer can back out for almost any reason. Let's read what some of those any reasons are. <clears throat> if the buyer chooses not to conduct an inspection, skip the section. If indicated, this contract is contingent upon the buyer's approval of the conditions of the property, and the buyer shall have the right to conduct inspections, investigations, tests, surveys, and other studies at the buyer's expense. Buyer is strongly advised to exercise these rights and to make the buyer's own selection of professionals with appropriate qualifications to conduct inspector, inspections of the entire property. Buyers sometimes will say, if you set it up, that you are the one that chose the inspector. Right now I've got some people that are trying to get a whole brand new roof done on a house and all these other things and they're complaining that the agent from our office chose the inspector and in all their correspondence they say, your inspector did this. We don't wanna be the ones that chose the inspector. We give them some names and say, I've had very good luck with ABC inspections. They're the ones that call ABC inspections. They're the ones that set it up. We're the ones that facilitate the date and time. You don't order it because the bill will come to you if you order it. We want the buyer to order it. We want the buyer to feel comfortable with that person. We will coordinate the time to get them in. Okay? So they're encouraged to choose their own. Buyer shall keep the property free and clear of liens, indemnify and hold the seller harmless from all liability, claims, demands, damages, and costs, and repair any damages arising from the inspections. So what if the inspector pops the circuit breaker to a freezer full of meat 
and it goes bad because nobody noticed it and it kept going on for several weeks until it finally was noticed. Who's responsible for that? According to the contract, it says the buyer is. Okay? What if the buyer hires somebody to come out and look at the, the gas fireplace and the person tags it and turns it off and there's no more heat in the house? Is that considered damage? It could be. We do not bring the, the inspector for the city to come out to the home. It says that. We don't do that. You have somebody else inspect it. If they see a, a problem, you alert that other party. Do you want us to turn this off or whatever? You don't want to have a government official red tag it because that is causing harm to the seller, and you could be liable for it. Same thing if the property has the water turned off, and they don't want it turned on because they supposedly winterized it. Oh, we don't want to pay to have it be done, so let's go just turn it on and check, and it floods. You now have a problem. The inspector falling through the ceiling because they climbed up, it, up above and they went through the sheetrock. You're responsible for that. So you need to make sure you have a good inspector that does certain things. I just got a paper from one inspector the other day that they guarantee certain things and will pay the, the house if there's a, for the house if there's a problem. I wonder how good that is. Because I'd, like, I'd rather have somebody that has some, if they do a good job, that would protect me as well. Just in case something happened. So make sure you have a competent person doing the inspections. Continuing on. Seller <clears throat> damages arising from the inspection. Seller shall make the property available for inspection and agrees to accept the reasonably and, ex and expense for making sure that all the utilities are turned on no later than blank business days to if left blank from acceptance for the inspection, except for the phone, cable, and internet. No inspections may be made by a government building or zoning inspector or government employee without the prior consent of the seller unless required by local law. You don't have to have the phone on. Most people don't use the phone. You don't have to have the internet on for that type of stuff. Uh, cable, you don't have to have it on. But all the other utilities, water, sewer, garbage, should be made available. Sewer, they don't normally check. You just assume it's going out. Yeah, huh. But the water, the gas, the power, you want those things on so you can check it. A big problem we have is during the winter time, the air conditioner might not get checked completely. Or in the summertime, the furnace doesn't get checked completely. So then when that season comes around, that's when we get a phone call. That's why many times we might have a home warranty or propose something like that that our sellers might want to include just in case. This next thing, if you mark it, this offer is subject to a short sell approval by a mortgage company. The time frames for completing inspection shall begin upon written approval of the short sell by the mortgage company and or lien holders. So if you mark this and it's a short sell, you have a little bit more time before you have to conduct that inspection. Now I have other people asking, well, what if we want to wait because we're in backup offer? situation. We're offer number two. Well, it doesn't say on here anywhere that's been marked that we're going to hold off on that time frame to conduct our inspections. So you might want to write that up in an, in an addendum or something under the paragraph four other terms and conditions. All time frames not to begin until this offer goes into first position, something along those lines. That way you don't have to do all these things or you haven't met the, the time frames. Or let them expire. Time frame for the inspections. There are two different inspections or walkthroughs, I mean. Well, there's two different walkthroughs and there's also two different parts here for the inspections. Buyer's inspection contingency allows a buyer to conduct a general inspection of the property, which includes all aspects of the property, included, including but not limited to the neighborhood conditions, zoning and use allowances, environmental conditions, applicable school districts, and or any other aspect pertaining to the property or relating to the living environment of the property, hereafter referred to as the primary inspection. So if I wanted to make sure that this home, the sun set at a certain time or the, the way the sun was on the front porch, could I cancel because of something like that? I could. Or this one happened. The bus to pick up the kids takes an hour to get them to school. So they didn't want to buy the house. Could they back out because of that? 
Yes, they did. I could go through so many different situations. That's why the time frame for this needs to be as short as you can to be reasonable because otherwise the buyers can back out for any reason. Any reason. I didn't like it. The color of the carpet's just not exactly what I want. Well, you saw it before. You saw it. You knew it. Well, that's why I'm backing out. Then it says, except for additional items or conditions specifically reserved in the secondary inspection below, shall, within blank business days, five the left blank of acceptance, complete these inspections and give to the seller written notice of disapproval of items or conditions, or, doesn't say both, or written notice of termination of this agreement based on an unsatisfactory inspection. So they can either write back and say, we're unsatisfied and we want you to correct this, these items, or they can say, we're just terminating. That's what your buyer can do. Once the buyer delivers written notice to the seller, it shall end the buyer's time frame for inspections other than those specifically res reserved in the secondary inspection below and is irrevocable regardless of if it was provided prior to the deadline stated above. If you have 10 days to do your inspections and you give them a notice after day three, you still don't get seven those other seven days and say, oh, we're changing our inspection, we're adding something to it. No, once you give them that, RE10 is the form we typically use, but it could be in writing. Once you give the seller that notification, the other days are gone, and the time frame for them to respond is then. Everybody understand that? I have people that call and argue about that. We, we have to make sure we understand that part. Can you extend certain parts? Or you could extend certain parts if you wanted to, but right now, all of that is the primary inspection. Now we're going to go into the secondary one. And there's some spots on here that say other, and you can write down what those other ones are that you want to extend. Secondary inspection. I'm going to zoom this in just a little bit so we can see a little bit better. That's so much fun. We'll do it another time. Mm -hmm. Secondary inspection. Items or conditions marked below, if any, allow the buyer the indicated additional time to conduct inspections of only those items or conditions. If not indicated below, buyer shall may still conduct these inspections, but must do so under the 10B1 primary inspection time frame. So if you don't specify it here, it, it counts as the other one, the primary inspection. You have to meet that time frame up there, okay? Buyer shall, within each time frame stated below, it says each, so we have multiple time frames now. Each time frame stated below, complete the inspections indicated and give to the seller written notice of the disapproved of item or condition or written notice of termination of this agreement based on an unsatisfactory inspection of that item or condition. Once the buyer delivers written notice to the seller, it shall end the buyer's time frame for only that item or condition and is irrevocable regardless if it was provided prior to the deadline stated below. Any notice provided under this subsection is unrelated to a notice provided under subsection 10B1. Buyer shall be responsible for the cost of all indicated inspections otherwise unless otherwise noted in the cost paid by section or elsewhere here, elsewhere herein. Buyer reserves the right to conduct the following inspections outside the primary inspection timeframe. So up top they have, let's say they've got five, five days to do all those things. But down here, the domestic well water test isn't gonna be done within that time frame. So they can conduct everything else except for the well test. So they'll mark that here and it says 10 business days. Is that gonna be long enough? Yes or no? If not, put a different number down here. Septic. Well, they've called and the septic guy can't come out because he's quite busy for 15 days. So you might mark this one and put down 15 business days. Survey. Well, it's going to take long. If you're going to do that one, you put it down. Other. You can put down on here other inspection. It could be uh, you're going to do a lead-based paint. You're going to do a radon test. It could be whatever you want and put down a different time frame. Now, that first one, that primary inspection. So within those first five days, you've done everything there. You'll fill out an RE10 and say, okay, we accept the premises as it is and we're done. Or you can say, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, we want these items corrected. So if you fill that RE10 out and you want those items corrected and the seller agrees to it, then that inspection's done. The seller will take care of it. Or you said everything's fine. Then you're done with that inspection. Or you said, we want to terminate, then you terminate the whole thing. But let's say that you wanted a couple items corrected. The seller said, okay, the primary inspection is now done. 
However, you marked a couple things on the secondary inspection. You marked the well and septic. So the well water test comes back and it's acceptable. So you get a copy of that, you fill out an RE10 because you already did one for the primary and the septic hasn't come back yet, so you're just doing it for this one. You'll say, and you'll mark off the domestic water well and you accept it. Now, we're waiting for the septic inspection. It comes back. So if you're the listing agent, whatever things that they mark, the primary inspection and any secondary inspections, if there's three things, you need to either have one RE10 that addresses all three things or one RE10 that addresses two and one that addresses the other. You just have to make sure that all the different items are addressed with an RE10 or other document. Okay? So that's why when people are inspecting our checking our RE10 for compliance, sometimes we might have more than one RE10 that covers those different inspections. Satisfaction of inspection contingencies. Each following subsection shall apply to the buyer's primary inspection and, if indicated in 10b2 above, shall also apply independently and repeatedly to each item or condition for which the buyer reserved additional time. If no time was reserved for any additional items, then there will only be one notice required. If additional time was reserved in 10b2, there may be multiple notices. If the buyer does not, within the strict time period, give to the seller written notice of disapproved of items. So we have the time frame to do our inspections. For some reason, within those five days, we didn't give the notice to the seller, okay? So if we didn't give to the seller written notice of disapproved of items or conditions or written notice of termination of this agreement under the primary inspection or any particular 10b2 reserved item, buyer shall, for only that particular inspection or item or condition, conclusively be deemed to have A, completed applicable inspections, investigations, reviews of applicable documentation and disclosures, B, assumed all liability, responsibility, and expense for the repairs or corrections for that particular inspection or item or condition, and C, waive the buyer's right to terminate based upon that particular item or condition. So, we, working with the buyers, must pay particular attention to the details. I like to get out a piece of paper and my little calendar, and I say, okay, everybody signed it on the first. We now have five days. So, the second is day one, the third is day two, and I go through, whether it's calendar or business days, and by this date at 5 p.m., we have to respond. If we don't respond, it just said that we've accepted that. So if there's something we wanted inspected and we didn't do it and we didn't counsel our buyers to get that done, they've missed out. Is that how you guys read it? They've missed out. Now, buyer not providing one written notice shall not affect the buyer's rights regarding other unrelated notices and inspections. So if they missed inspection number one, and didn't do anything, and we have inspection two, the secondary inspections for the other things, we can still respond to those. Now, if the buyer does, within the strict period, give to the seller written notice of termination under this ag agreement, then it's done. We still need them to sign it. But if they also send something about unsatisfactory, uh, oh, that whole one talks about unsatisfactory, so the earnest money shall be returned to the buyer. This one, if the buyer does give to the seller, a list of disapproved of items, it shall end the buyer's time frame for that particular ins inspection and is irre irrevocable. So if they did it on day three and they had five days, they don't get those other two days. The buyer shall provide the seller pertinent sections of a written inspection reports upon request, if applicable. Upon receipt of written notice, seller shall have three business days and I'm just going to put the defaults. You can put different days numbers in there. Three business days in which to respond in writing. Seller, at the seller's option, may agree to correct the items as requested by the buyer in the notice or may elect not to do so. If the seller agrees to, in writing to correct the items or condition requested by the buyer, then the said agreement will become an integral part of this, agree of this contract. Otherwise, immediately upon a written response from the seller that rejects the buyer's request in whole or in part, that could mean that they say, oh, we're not going to do number two, or they cross it off and make any change whatsoever. In whole or in part, said response is irrevocable, and buyer may proceed under 10C4 below. Okay, so we write up an offer. We do our inspection. We, as the buyer's side, write to the sellers, and we want them to correct two things. If the seller is unwilling to do it, or they come back with a change, we can back out. Okay, so right now, if they agree to it, we're in the transaction. So if they sign it, 
we're, we're still going forward. But if they send something back or they cross off something and we need to acknowledge that change, or they come back with a different RE10 that says something different, that's gonna be here under number four. If the seller does not agree to correct the buyer's disapproved of items or conditions within the strict time period, or the seller does not respond in writing within the strict time period, then the buyer has the option of either proceeding with the transaction without the seller being responsible for correcting the deficiencies stated in that particular notice, or giving the seller's written notice within blank three business days that the buyer will not continue with the transaction and will receive the earnest money back. So if they don't respond, you have three days to say we're terminating or you're going through. So if the seller misses the time frame, it puts that onus back on us. Now, it says that the buyer does not give written notice of cancellation. So they didn't respond to us. The time frame came by. We didn't respond to them and say we're going to terminate. What happens? If the buyer does not give written notice of cancellation within the strict time period specified, buyer shall conclusively be deemed to have elected to proceed with the transaction without the repairs or corrections stated in that particular notice. So I wanted the roof to be replaced. The seller, for some reason, couldn't respond in those three days to us. Okay? What happens? So they didn't send something back to us saying that they were or weren't going to do it. Three days come and go that we had the time frame to say we're terminating. Now what? We either have to go forward or... or... We, technically, we have to go forward because we should have given a notice to terminate, and we didn't. So we had that opportunity. We didn't. So now the seller's happy because we're supposed to buy the property because we didn't terminate the contract within our time frame, even though they were the ones that didn't respond. We have to pay attention to these deadlines, okay? Buyer is electing to proceed with the transaction under the buyer's primary inspection or a single inspection reserved under whatever. Shall not affect the buyer's right regarding other inspections. So if there's still a time frame for something else, it's still viable, but that other one's not. Home warranty programs are available for purchase, and it just mentions that. Lead-based paint disclosure, we have the opportunity to conduct that. So make sure that we have that done. Mold disclaimer. It just talks about that there could be mold there. Square footage, if they want to verify that. Seller's property disclosure form. Here, if you have received it prior to closing, mark that here. Why? Remember the three days I was talking about rescinding? When we audit this for in, and we inspect it, if it marks that they have got it here already, then we know that that time clock of those three days have passed. If not, we have to look at the dates on the property disclosure form to see if it was three days prior to closing. And if it says yes on here, then we know we need one. If it says not applicable, then we know that possibly we don't need a property disclosure form for this lot. Covenants, conditions, restrictions, they have five business days to review those. And it was added into this particular paragraph that we as agents do not need to verify those. However, if the client or customer tells you they want to buy a property that, cannot, that can have dogs for kenneling or something, make sure you get a copy of those ahead of time so that they can review them to see that they can do what they want with that particular property. Subdivision Homeowners Association. Buyers aware that membership in Homeowners Association may be required, so they have to qualify or review those to make sure that they're fine. You can put down who's going to pay for the different things here and the costs. And as a listing agent, you should get this information ahead of time, know what the costs are so they can be negotiated. Costs paid for and by whom? Seller agrees to pay up to how much money of lender repaired repair costs only. So if, if it's an FHA loan and you know that there's a few things that need to be done, put something down here. Right now, everybody's excited. So if you put $500 down here for lender repair costs, not home inspection, but lender repair costs, they're responsible for it. If you know that a roof's going to be done, or be required, or painting's going to be done, put that down under Paragraph four, other terms and conditions, that they're responsible to pay for it. Buyer to re redo the roof at their expense or something, if they've already obligated or said that they're going to do it. Can we put a percentage in there? This only permits a dollar figure, because this is for repair costs, because they're not going to come up with a percentage. Because when, when the appraiser comes back, he's going to say, this needs to be done, this needs to be done, this needs to be done for the VA or FHA loan. And then you just get those things done. Now, if it exceeds those numbers, and we're going to read that here in a minute, 
it says buyer or seller has the option to pay any lender required repair costs in excess of that amount. So if you've obligated the first $500 to the seller and there's $200 more that needs to be paid and the buyer's willing to pay it, we still have a deal. If nobody wants to pay those $200, then we have a concern. It used to be that it was on here that the deal died if it didn't get paid for by the seller. But when the market got hot, the seller didn't want to do certain things because it would fall apart and they could take another offer. Upon, success, upon closing, seller agrees to pay blank percent of the purchase price or blank a dollar amount, and they have left blank as seller's concessions. This can be used towards lender approved buyer's closing costs, lender fees, and prepaid costs, which include our but are not limited to those items in the buyer's columns marked below. This concession can also be used for any other expense not related to financing at the buyer's discretion. So if I say $5,000 and I can only find $3,500 worth of stuff, the rest of that I could have be a gift card to Home Depot, as long as my lender's okay with it, or anything. Okay? I had a broker from another office it wasn't broker. It was the owner of another office get upset at me because this could give away who it is because she said that the buyers were getting a trip to Disneyland or an airfare to go do something. I said, I don't care what the, what the money goes to because your seller agreed to pay up to $5,000 of whatever cost they are. As long as the lender's okay with it, I'm okay with it. Your seller agreed to pay $5,000. Well, we agreed to the $5,000 because we didn't think they could find $5,000 worth of stuff. I go, okay, that's your fault. You should have countered back if you didn't think that was going to be the case. But here it says up to this amount. So I would put down on your net sheet up to that amount. Your seller was planning to pay that amount anyway, possibly. As it used to be, if it wasn't used or couldn't be found, that they didn't pay it. So they started putting like an extra year on a home warranty or prepaid some taxes or something to use that extra money. But now it can be used for anything as long as that lender will approve it. Any questions? Here's marking different things. Now, these are all negotiable, but depending on the type of loan, there are sometimes certain things that must be paid for by a certain party, okay? Now, the appraisal fee. Over in Boise, the seller typically pays for the appraisal. That's different. Here, we, the buyer, typically pays for it. Appraisal reinspect fee. Well, different schools of thought. I typically mark down the seller because if the home wasn't prepared for the appraiser to come through and they have to come back again, that was the seller's fault, in my opinion, to not have that one attic area opened or available for them to look at or some other thing that they have to check. Closing escrow fee. Share equally. Both the buyer and the seller are receiving a benefit from the title company. Lender document preparation fee. That is typically a buyer's cost because they've chosen to have a loan. Tax service fee. That's to verify that the taxes have been paid. I put that down for the seller. Make sure that their taxes have been paid. Flood certification or tracking fee. This is typically a buyer's expense, but I many times will put it as a seller, so it's negotiable. It's to find out if the home is in a flood zone, and if so, then they're going to be required to have flood insurance. Their lender will require that. Lender required inspections. Typically, that's a buyer's expense. They're getting the loan to do so. But up above, we said that the seller is responsible for the first X number of dollars of those inspections. Attorney contract preparation review fee. Normally, we don't have attorneys involved, so it's not applicable. But there could be something. Title insurance standard coverage. This is typically the seller's responsibility. Up above, we talk about that the seller will provide proof of marketable title. How can we do that? A title insurance policy would prove that. There are some people that are come from out of state, like a, a relocation company that says, no, we never pay title insurance. Then how are you going to verify or provide proof to us that you have, that you can sell this free and clear? Well, the buyer's going to have to pay it. So we try our best and explain that to them, that in Idaho, the seller typically pays for the standard title policy. Now, the extended policy are optional. Sometimes we could ask the seller to pay for it, or the buyer could. But for, that's the, this one here. The lender's policy, that's going to be a buyer's expense typically because they're having a loan on it and you pay extra to cover the lender. Domestic well water. Now, there's two different things here. Up here, it says who's going to pay for it. And here is where it says who's going to order it. 
So the domestic well water test, I typically am going to want the seller to pay for it. We're having problems with this clicking. And I typically will have the seller order it. Now, the problem with doing that for the, cell, the water and the septic stuff is many times the seller is going to wait a little while because they don't want to pay for it yet. Oh, I don't want to pay for it and come out of pocket. I'll wait till we get closer to closing. Well, we have time frames up above that say we need to have that back within a certain time frame. So maybe it would be better that the buyer order some of these things because they can choose who they want. The listing agent can make all the arrangements to make sure that they can get in. You can call and get it set up. But that way, it's ordered on time so they get the report back. And it comes to you so you know about it, that even though the seller's paying for it. You can do that, but the sellers typically want to know how much it's going to be if they're paying for it. Okay? So those are some pros and cons. So that's the water potability test. Now, water potability test is to know that it's good to drink. Now, the productivity test is for the flow of the water. So make sure that there's enough water flowing for it. Lenders many times will require well and septic tests because if there's no water to the property, no one's going to be able to live in it very easily. We had a time when one was not done because the lender didn't call for it. And it turned out to be the, there was a problem. So they got mad. That, oh, the agent should have known you should have done this. It's tough to prove something along those lines. Septic inspections, same thing, and survey. Typically, we don't have a survey done. It can be costly. Sometimes people want the pins to be marked or to be found or to mark off where they think the line is. But the only true way to know where the property boundaries are is to have a survey. These other lines, you can mark things down. Now, you can put down home inspection, not home inspection, home warranty. Now, if you're going to have a home warranty and mark who's paying for it, I'd like you to put down how much it's going to be. Like, you could say a Freedom Home Warranty or American Home Show Home Warranty or a Landmark Home Warranty. Cost not to exceed and put down how much it is. Or put down the specific one you want because they have different ones, like the, the Super Cool Home Warranty. That's 750 bucks. Whatever it is, specify it, then you can mark down seller to pay it. They already know how much it's going to cost because you put it down on here. Okay? Any other questions? I've had people put a buyer transaction fee on here. That's okay because we need to have it be disclosed and they put down the buyer to pay for it. But that way, in Idaho, if you're having the buyer, certain fees have to be disclosed. If an agent's receiving a fee from a buyer and from a seller, we have to disclose that. So if the buyer's receiving a fee and also receiving compensation, it must be disclosed. And some people put that here. I don't see that very often, but that's what some people have done. Hey, I have five minutes. I know. Okay. Just check it out in class. All right. Occupancy. Buyer does or does not intend to occupy the property. That can a, a trigger whether they have the homeowner's exemption or not for taxes. Risk of loss or neglect. Prior to sell disclosing, the liability remains with the seller. I've had sellers cancel their homeowner's insurance or stop making the payments to their home because it's now on the market. No. Keep paying. Walkthroughs. There are two different walkthroughs. The first walkthrough shall be within three business days after the, accept, uh, after the work has been done. If you ask for certain work to be done, they have three days after that work's done to make sure it was done. Okay? And the second one is prior to closing, they'll go through and make sure that everything that was said that was supposed to be done is done, that it's not changed in any substantial way. It doesn't say that you can bring up new items. So if there is a stain in the carpet under the floor that wasn't there before, technically you're not supposed to be able to bring that up and back out of it. However, we have addressed things like that because it was hidden, it wasn't able to be seen, so we can address that. But technically we are not. Singular and plural, foreclosure notice, it talks about if it's under foreclosure, we must use the RE42 document to be disclosed to the parties. Mechanics liens, general contractor disclosure statement, it talks about that, <clears throat> that we must, anything exceeding $2,000, we need to make sure that there is a lien waiver or that's been removed. Sales price information pursuant to Idaho code, sold price of real property is not confidential client information. If you ever have somebody that says, oh, I don't want this to be reported to the MLS, too bad. They found the property through the MLS, it will be reported to the MLS. Otherwise, we are not going to be part of the MLS. We can't be there. So I had, had a thing this last 
week or so of people wanting it to be excluded. We don't. Yeah. So on one of mine, they wanted it to be confidential, and we said no. But then when the when it closed on the MLS, they didn't want it as closed and was accepted. They kept it as open. Right, and that's wrong. So it needs to be corrected and changed. And I dealt with one with a group here in our office last week where they were doing that, so I had to write a letter to the seller that says we are going to disclose it. Okay, so it's supposed to be disclosed. And if it hasn't been, check again, let me know, and I will put that information in. They actually did publish again. Okay. Because I wrote a letter to that seller and explained to them, or to the buyer, I, I, explaining the laws and our responsibility for it, and that we will be reporting it. Whether that agent gave it to that seller, I don't know. Now I wonder. Okay. <laughs> Transmission of documents, we can send everything. If for some reason it's such a bad copy, everybody's agreeing to sign a more legible copy of it. Wire transfer warning, business days defined, calendar days defined, attorney's fees, everybody takes care of their own fees. Default, if the buyer defaults, there's two options. One, they can accept the earnest money as liquidated damages, or two, they can go after the, the buyer for, for costs. Now, we have to keep in mind liquidated damages. If I accept the earnest money and it's $500 and I accept that as liquidated damages, that means I'm not going to sue them for anything else. If I don't accept the earnest money and I want to sue them for actual damages, I can make a list of all the costs. I had to, I missed out on a mortgage payment. I missed out on this. I missed out on that. I had to hire this other person. I have a list of actual damages. So you have to be careful if you settle for liquidated damages or if you're going to go for actual damages. Earnest money dispute interpolator. We talked about the interpolator. Counterparts. Counterparts are when you have this document and one of your sellers has signed this one and one of your sellers has signed this one. We want everybody to be on the same one, but there are times when we have counterparts, different people that have signed different documents. Non-applicable to fine, severability. We mentioned that before. Representation confirmation. In the packet that I've given you, it shows how to mark this particular part specifically. And so if we look at that, that way you can read it later because we are out of time. <clears throat> it talks about the different things on there. It says, trying to get that right page. Here it is. Representation confirmation. If you have a buyer's representation agreement signed with the buyers and the listing is with another company, you would mark the boxes as follows. Section 1 would be A and Section 2 would be A. The brokerage working with the buyers acting as an agent for the buyers. The brokerage working with the sellers is acting as an agent for the sellers. If you do not have a buyer's representation agreement with the buyers and the listing is with another company, you would mark the boxes as Section 1 would be D, non-agent, and Section 2 would be A. They have a listing. If you have a buyer's representation agreement signed with the buyers and the agent working with the seller does not have a seller representation agreement signed with the sellers, like a builder for sub owner, you'd mark it. And it goes through all the different scenarios that are there. Okay? So you can mark that correctly. Closing, you put down the closing date, the closing company, where? Located at. Long-term escrow, typically we don't have that. Possession, typically we'll mark that it'll be given upon closing. Prorations, upon closing. Now, you can say excuse me, the possession is going to be three days prior to closing. Well, if that's the case, you better make sure if you're the listing agent that you see that they want to move in three days before closing or it's a different date. Or if you counter and you don't change all the dates, it could say that closing possession is one thing and closing is a different date. So make sure you're checking all those things. That's why I like to mark closing because if you change the closing date on a counter, it changes possession. Prorations will be as of closing. Is there fuel in the tank? Yes or no, and is it going to be reimbursed? Assignment, can this be assigned to somebody else? That means instead of being John and Sue, they're buying the home, they could assign it to somebody else to get it later. Typically, when that happens, it could be, for a commercial transaction, it happens a little bit more often because it could be Costco coming to town and they don't want to disclose that they're the ones buying it so it's in this one name and then right at closing it gets assigned to somebody else. Or you're trying to buy four lots here and you're buying them separately and don't want everybody to know that you're going to do something bigger with it. Or you're the neighbor that nobody likes and the person says, I'm never selling my farm to that person because 
this or that. So they buy it under somebody else's name, and then they assign it over prior to closing. Entire agreement, you have the right to read the fine print in full, all the addendums and everything, time is of the essence. Authority of signatory, make sure that you have any documents you need to prove that you have that. Acceptance, they have until a date and time to accept this offer. It says the attached buyer's addendums, buyer's exhibits, if anything. Buyer must disclose that they hold an Idaho real estate license and if they're related to the agent. And then the sellers would sign it as well. However, if you have this offer and the sellers sign it and agree to it late and you don't have a counter offer, this bottom part of this agreement, the late acceptance would be signed. You can mark down on here that within three days, if the buyer's just initial here, that their offer was still good for those three days. If it turns out to be it was longer than that, you can change it to be seven calendar days, 10, whatever, as long as there's not a counter offer. If there's a counter offer that's been given, you don't sign the bottom for the late acceptance. The counter offer has a new date and time, and that's the document that you're going by. Or you could use an addendum that says that the, the time for acceptance has been extended to this, and they have everybody sign it. Or you could go up to here where it says they have to sign it by a certain date and time and have everybody initial it. So there's multiple ways you can do it, but that's what that bottom part of that contract is. Any questions on the RE21? I know we are out of time and we did not hit all of the other buying documents, but our two hours have come and gone. The other documents that we would have talked about would have been the counter offer form, the addendum form, which are just documents. Now addendums, every addendum that you have needs to be signed by everybody, okay? Now, if there's an addendum that's written up that's not going to be signed, you need to reference it on another addendum that says addendum number one is null and void. Counter offers, every counter offer that we have, the last counter offer is the one that's, that goes together. So if you have counter offer one and it has five things on it, you have counter number two, it only has two things on it. We don't even look at things that were written on counter one. Everything must be written on counter two. So some people say, oh, well, we're still agreeing to everything on counter one except for this item. That's not the case. The last counter offer must have everything on there that you're agreeing to. And the date and time on that counter offer is what gets sold, okay? But you still need to turn in counter one and two or whatever so we can see the mine process. Then the RE10 inspection, inspection contingency notice, we talked a little bit about that. You need to have one for each of the different inspections that need to be done. Then we have the RE20 termination agreement. You can have people sign the, to terminate the contract, but not to release the earnest money. Or you can have people release the earnest money, but not terminate the contract. So there's two different parts on here. Okay. Then we have the addendum 20, RE27, seller's right to continue to market the premises. That's a good form if, you're, if someone's trying to keep the home on the market, or it could be for some other reason that they want to keep it on the market until they're sure with everything that you're doing. There's a promissory note, how we can talk about filling that out. And then there's the RE41, which is used when you're doing a HUD offer or some other offer that doesn't show the agency and the broker, the responsible broker. And we also, the last thing on here talks about the receipt for earnest money. Well, the home warranty inspection form, which is good to have to just talk with your buyers and sellers. It waives part of the fee for your e &O insurance, part of the deductible. I think it takes off twenty-five dollars or $5,000 of the deductible deductible if everybody signs that. Home warranty and professional inspection notice was that. Receipt of earnest money, it just talks about how to do that or how to use this particular form. There's two on this document or to get one from the title company. So you have a copy of that. And that's everything and we are five minutes over. Any questions anybody has? Hope this is a resource for you and if you have questions, please call me. I'd rather help you before you write something up than trying to correct it afterwards. It makes you look a whole lot better too when you're filling it out ahead of time versus going back to try to correct something, okay? Thanks for being here. Have a great time at Lagoon. You know, that's, you always hear, have the rest of your day here at Disneyland or whatever.